The stunning allegation from Prime Minister Justin Trudeau that a brutal murder here in Canada may in fact have been a hit ordered by foreign intelligence agents has Canada in a diplomatic standoff with India. What should we be bracing for next? I'm Mercedes Stevenson. Welcome to the West Wall. India calls the Trudeau government's bombshell allegations false and politically motivated. But Ottawa says they're based on credible intelligence. As India retaliates and Canada's allies issue a muted response, we'll look at what to expect and the economic and national security risks our country is facing. And while India gives the cold shoulder, Justin Trudeau found a warm embrace with Ukraine's Volodymyr Zelensky on his first visit to Canada since the war began. We have Defence Minister Bill Blair on the show to talk about Canada's promises to Ukraine and to rearm the Canadian military. They were the shocking words that reverberated around the world uttered by the Prime Minister on the first day back in the House of Commons. Canadian security agencies have been actively pursuing credible allegations of a potential link between agents of the government of India and the killing of a Canadian citizen, Hardeep Singh Nijar. The prominent Sikh leader was shot and killed by two masked gunmen outside a Sikh temple in Surrey, B.C. in June. The Indian government's retaliation was swift, suspending visas and levelling allegations of their own. Any country that uh, needs to look at this, I think it is Canada and its growing reputation as a place, uh, as a safe haven for terrorists, for extremists and for organized crime. Mr. Trudeau now finds himself in a diplomatic battle with the world's largest democracy and a critical counterweight to China in the region. India is a country of growing importance uh, and a country that we uh, need to continue uh, to work with. And we're not looking to provoke. Joining me now to discuss what's at stake is former Canadian Ambassador Arif Lalani. He was pretty high up in Canada's Global Affairs Department, and he's now at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. We're also joined by Veena Najabula. She is an adjunct professor at the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs at the University of British Columbia. But you probably remember her from her incredible advocacy to free the two Michaels once they were jailed in China. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Uh, this was just a, a shocking and surprising development for everyone who was watching. Arif, can you walk us through a little bit of what is happening here and has led to this point? Well, I think what you're seeing is, first, clearly there must have been a, a real breakdown in the back channel discussions. I mean, I know officials have been working very hard behind the scenes to try and get India's cooperation. Um, and the statement by the Prime Minister on Monday clearly reveals a, a breakdown in whatever communications were, were happening. I think the second thing is the level at which this was done. Uh, this could have been done uh, by other officials or other ministers, but you have the Prime Minister of the country in the House of Commons accusing uh, uh, another democratic ally uh, of a criminal act on our, on our soil. So uh, I, I think that uh, basically made it clear that we were going to have quite a uh, high level response from the Indians. So we're seeing this, I, I think, unfortunately, as I'd said uh, earlier, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And we're really going to have to move now to try to contain this uh, to the government to government issues and, and try and protect activities in the private sector, protect activities uh, between people. And we're already seeing that that's already being impacted. So it, it's going to be a tough road ahead. And there are huge economic, uh, social and political ties between Canada and India. So there's a lot potentially in jeopardy here. Veena, it's, it's fascinating to me that it feels very different than what the diplomatic standoff with China did. That was a slower build. Once it happened, it went on and on. It went through, of course, the two Michaels. It went into uh, allegations of interference in Canadian elections. A lot of people feel that this just popped up. What strikes you about the difference in how this evolved and how it's being played out by the government uh, versus the China situation, which you were so deeply involved in? Um, yes, thank you, Mercedes. Well, first of all, these two diplomatic crises are really, really different. In some ways, and of course, our response to them seems to be, 
while similar, but it's landing differently in that in the case of China, we stood on values and we very much stood on the principle of rule of law and that Canada is a rule of law country. But that value based approach was aligned with the U.S. strategic interests in competition with China. And even though we stood on principle at the end of the day, it was the U.S. that had to engage in pragmatic negotiations and really difficult conversations with China to resolve that dispute and bring our hostages home. In the case of India, we're seeing the same language from the prime minister who said that we are grounding ourselves again in the rule of law and that we will stand on the principle that this kind of violation of our sovereignty is unacceptable, which is, of course, correct and uh, very much laudable. But the issue here is that there are also then national interests, both that U.S. and our allies have, and even we have, as articulated in our Indo-Pacific strategies. The fact that India is seen as a global leader, is seen as a counterbalance to China, and that we are also seeing the difference in the way our allies are responding. While they stand with us on the principle that this kind of violation of sovereignty and a targeted killing of a Canadian on Canadian soil is a red line that shouldn't be crossed, and if India is, in fact, responsible, then, of course, countries like U.S. and Canada have to make it clear that that's not acceptable and we have to deter it from happening again. But at the same time, nobody wants to pick a fight with India and not even Prime Minister, who by Thursday was already kind of taking it back a bit and saying that nobody's trying to provoke India and that we're still really very much hoping to have cooperation from India on this investigation. So I guess the real question is what happens next and what will India do next? Arif, where do you foresee this going? Do you foresee this being another China situation that drags on for years and potentially has very serious economic consequences for Canada? Or do you think that there's a possibility that this could be resolved relatively quickly despite the seriousness of the allegations? Well, I don't think it's going to be resolved quickly. But uh, I do think that actually the next step uh, really hinges in some ways on what Canada will do. So the Indians have, uh, you might suggest, escalated by suspending uh, visas for all travelers, which is a major step, uh, has financial and, and social implications. But this file is ultimately going to hinge on a Canadian investigation of a criminal act uh, in which we have found that uh, a foreign country may have been involved. Uh, so ultimately, we're going to have to proceed with our investigation. That's exactly what the British did when they felt that the Russians were responsible for uh, assassinating uh, by using poison somebody on their territory uh, and ultimately the British investigation had to conclude and then others could decide whether they supported it. So I think there's a couple of things that have to be done here. One, we really have to work to contain this crisis to the essential issue which is a criminal investigation in which we want India's cooperation. Uh, and uh, I, I think until that's done, um, uh, our friends and allies will remain our friends and allies but it's really going to be for us to take this fight. I think they have done what they can do. And I'm not sure that there's uh, more that our friends are going to be able to do, because what more can they do in the absence of, of intelligence that we can share um, publicly? There's, there's some realpolitik here with the interests of other countries who also need to build with India because it can counterweight China. So a little bit different than everyone could rally around and, and say something very tough to China or something very tough to Russia. India is supposed to be the alternative. Now Canada finds itself in this situation. Uh, I want to get your opinion on this too, Vina, but I, I want to go to you first, Arif, because you were, you were in global affairs for so long. Were you surprised that the government came out and talked about classified information in this case that they didn't appear to have certainty on? I know they believe it very strongly. I've spoken to a number of national security officials who say uh, that they believe the intelligence is very strongly indicating India was behind this, but they haven't been categoric in saying it, and it's very different than how they've treated it in other cases. What do you think led to that decision? Well, it seems, I understand that the government needed to say something publicly because it seemed that it was going to get out into the media and, and uh, Canadians have a right to know and the government should inform them. So I think everyone understands that. Uh, I suspect what has surprised people is the level at which this case or this file was broken to the public, which is at the highest level of the prime minister. And so one has to wonder, you know, how is that going to help India come to the table? Um, maybe there was a different way to do that, but we are where we are now. And I think that's why we've seen a rather dramatic and very quick set of uh, developments here. Um, and, you know, you refer to the geopolitical situation. Look, it's going to be um, very hard for our friends, I think, to go much further than they have um, without some cost. 
not only to their relations, but this issue of everyone having an Indo-Pacific strategy on which India is a strong element to counter the, the Chinese projection of power is in everyone's interest. And frankly, uh, our allies need us to be there. And until this is resolved, we're not going to be there. And I think this is going to take some time to resolve. So um, we may be a little bit on the sidelines here uh, as, a, as, a, as we try to manage this crisis. You know, we just have a, a few moments left, unfortunately, but I want to give the last word to you. Yes, um, I want to say a couple of things. One is on uh, this issue of needing to contain this. I agree with the reef on this, but I also want to make sure that we understand that there are a couple of broader things at play here as well. Like one is obviously to make sure that there is a full investigation and that justice is served. The other one is to deter this kind of practice from happening in the future. This really is uh, a red line that should not be crossed. And I think Canada is right to make that principle and stand on it. And then the third is for us to preserve our broader bilateral relationship with India, as well as our engagement in the Indo-Pacific. So in other words, yes, we have to do quite a few things and we have to do them in a very difficult environment. And so far, it looks like India is really doubling down and not willing to engage. But I'm hopeful that there is room for actual collaboration. But for that to really happen, we also have to engage India on its concerns. And of course, we haven't touched on this, but this really gets into the diaspora politics. And I guess the only thing that I would say there is that our national interest has to come before diaspora domestic politics. And I think this case is going to force us as a country to have some conversations that are long overdue. Thank you both so much for joining us. We appreciate your time and your insight. Thanks, Mercedes. Thank you. Up next, Canada steps up support for Ukraine during a historic visit. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau reaffirmed Canada's steadfast support for Ukraine during a whirlwind visit by the Ukrainian president. Canada was clear, as we always are, that we will stand with Ukraine with whatever it takes for as long as it takes. And today, we're backing up this commitment with further support. Trudeau announced an additional $650 million in military aid over the next three years. That brings Canada's military aid to $2.4 billion. Canada's support for Ukraine comes at the same time that the Canadian military is under increasing pressure and could certainly use a major financial boost, according to a lot of experts and the troops. To talk about all this, I'm joined by Defence Minister Bill Blair. Welcome. Nice to see you again, Minister. Thank you very much, Mercedes. Good morning. I'd like to start out uh, by taking a step back from Ukraine, which we're going to get to in just a few seconds, to ask you uh, to put on your police officer hat again. You, of course, were a chief of police. We've had this allegation that Indian intelligence agents carried out a murder here in Canada, a hit on a Canadian citizen. Uh, and your government came out and actually spoke about it, which surprised a lot of people. As a police officer, are you at all concerned that disclosing that kind of information in public could jeopardize the investigation or the prosecution of the people who committed this murder? Well, first of all, Mercedes, we are deeply concerned by the credible evidence that we have received and intelligence that we have, we, have, we have been privy to that caused us to be deeply concerned. And at the same time, as a former police officer and certainly as a parliamentarian, uh, we are concerned about the integrity of the invest criminal investigation. It's a very important criminal investigation it's currently being con conducted by the RCMP. And, and I, I will be very cautious and, and need to be very cautious about you know, how we discuss uh, that matter and the intelligence that we, we are are acting on uh, in order not to in any way um, interfere with that investigation. It needs to proceed. We have reached out, of course, to the Indian government. We've, we've spoken to our allies um, and, and we've asked for all the support that is necessary to make sure that um, justice and the, and the truth can be determined in this case. One of the biggest commitments your government has made on the defense file is to the Indo-Pacific strategy. And it seems like now you're in a bit of a difficult situation with India. And the experts who we're speaking to on this show are saying they don't expect this standoff to disappear quickly. Has this jeopardized your government's ability to proceed with that if you have India uh, basically very angry with Canada and likely not looking to cooperate? Well, Mercedes, just to be very clear, if, if the intelligence that we've received um, is, is proven to, to be accurate, then, then there is a very significant concern that Canada will have with respect to the violation of our sovereignty and the murder of a, of a Canadian citizen on Canadian soil. 
And at the same time, I also want to acknowledge the importance of the Indo-Pacific strategy. We've been working very hard over the past several years, in, and most recently, um, in, in building trade agreements in, in the region and through the, the uh, Canadian Armed Forces, we have been increasing our presence and patrols in the region. And, and so the Indo-Pacific region, including our relationship with India, is important to us but also standing up for the international rules-based order and ensuring that we defend our sovereignty and our citizens is, is our first priority. And so, you know, we understand that, that this, is, this can be and, and, and has proven to be um, a challenging um, issue with respect to our relationship with, with India, but at the same time, we have a responsibility to defend, to defend the law, to defend our citizens, and at the same time, make sure that we conduct a, a thorough investigation and get to the truth. I know you had the opportunity to meet with the Ukrainian president as well as the Ukrainian defense minister. You've pledged more money for Ukraine as well as help training on F-16s, which just for our viewers to differentiate, is not the same as what Canada flies. That's the CF-18. So I understand this is going to be contracted out. We were previously providing actual Canadian military equipment, uh, but it seems like we've run out of that. And one of the concerns that I keep hearing from the troops minister is that they see money and equipment flowing to Ukraine, but they don't see it flowing back into the Canadian Armed Forces. Are you going to address that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Mercedes, my responsibility is, is, is for the Canadian Armed Forces. Um, we have made a commitment to, to significantly increase defence spending, almost 70 per cent, um, since 2017 as part of our safe, secure and engaged strategy. We are also working on bringing forward our, our new uh, def defence uh, policy update. And, and we have made significant investments in the 2023 budget. For example, we pledged $8 billion uh, in order to, to uh, enhance the, the ability and the capacity of the Canadian Armed Forces. And we've committed nearly $38 billion to the NORAD um, update that, that is taking place. Um, and at the same time, I, I'm, I work very closely now and I've, I've had the opportunity to be briefed. I know some of the, 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 the challenges that the Canadian Armed Forces is making with respect to people, with respect to the platforms that they work on and the equipment that they need. Uh, we are, I am absolutely committed to working with them and to ensure that we give the Canadian Armed Forces the people, the tools and the support that they need to do the important job uh, defending Canada's interests at home and, and abroad and upholding our responsibilities. Um, I was recently, for example, in, 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 in Germany and talking to many of our NATO allies. We understand our obligations there. We're building out um, a new uh, forward presence in, in, in Latvia as part of that NATO commitment. We also have significant responsibilities in our own country with respect to, to the Arctic, with, with the NORAD um, updates and uh, upgrades, and, and as well in the Indo-Pacific region. And so we've got to make sure that we give and support the Canadian Armed Forces with the resources that they need to do the important job we ask of them. Uh, so, Minister, I guess I'd question how you square that with um, an internal document that came out. It's publicly available. Anybody can read it. It's on the Canadian Forces app. And it's titled Reductions in Defence Spending. It's from the Deputy Minister and the Chief of the Defence Staff, and it talks about the Liberal government saying that they need to reduce their spending. So um, the money that you're citing, with all due respect, was already promised. None of it's replacing the equipment that was sent to Ukraine, sent to Ukraine pardon me. Um, and at the same time, you have a memo talking about reductions to defence spending. That seems to be incompatible logic. Well, and let me be very clear. We have a responsibility. We're spending hard-earned and, and needed Canadian tax dollars and, and the responsibility of every department of the government, including the Department of National Defence, is to make sure that we spend those dollars as efficiently as, as possible. And so I've asked the Dep Deputy Minister and the Chief of Defence Staff to look for those efficiencies and to make sure that we're getting the best value for that money and at the same time. There are, there are res resources available and we are seeking additional resources to invest in the Canadian Armed Forces. You know, we, we, we have our national shipbuilding strategy and we're building Building those platforms. We have also committed uh, to the new fighter jet. We also, and, and as you mentioned, we've made commitments to, to the Ukrainian people and to the Ukrainian president about providing uh, resources in, in artillery, in, in light armored vehicles, and other, and other items that are important also to CAF. And so what my responsibility and what we've been working to do is to make sure that we fulfill our commitments to Ukraine and at the same time we make sure that we get that production which in order to, to, to continue to supply with the Canadian Armed Forces with what they need. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to suggest it's not challenging, but it, it is the work that we are laser-like focused on to make sure that, for example, as those light armor vehicles are coming off the line um, at a production facility in London, Ontario, that, that some of them, them will be available to the Ukraine and 
we will also t take from that assembly line that which is required by CAF. I understand that, but I don't believe any of that covers the, the tanks, um, which you've not signed a contract for yet. Bigger picture, though, in all of this, are you prepared to commit that there will not be any cuts to defense spending? Well, what I'm prepared to commit to is, is, is on behalf of, of my government and, and, as, and it's our responsibility to Canadians to make sure that we're spending their tax dollars as efficiently as possible. And so I've asked the, 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 the Deputy Minister and the Chief of Defence to make sure that they go through all of our expenditures and make sure that we are doing those expenditures, doing the important work of supporting the Canadian Armed Forces as efficiently as possible. And, and that can, can involve a number of civilian positions. but. W Mercedes, one of the greatest challenges that we face in Canada right now, as armies right around the world, and I've, I've, I've been discussing this with my colleagues, uh, ministers of defense from all of our, our, our allies and partners, and there is a real challenge in making sure that we get the people that we need in the Canadian Armed Forces to do the important work um, that is required of them. And so I, I, I think my greatest responsibility is, is to people and make sure that we provide them, you know, we get the right number of them, but they also have the training, the equipment and the supports that they need. And we also know that we're going to have to invest, you know, significantly in, in, in reconstituting the Canadian Armed Forces because we are in an increasingly dangerous world. Our obligations to NATO, to NORAD, to the Indo-Pacific and right at home um, is critically important to Canadians and I have to make sure that the Canadian Armed Forces have the people and the resources they need to do the important job that we ask of them at home and abroad. I'm sure that's, that would be difficult in an environment if there are defence cuts. That's all the time we have for today, Minister, but thank you so much for joining us. Of course, Mercedes, thanks very much. Hope I can come back and talk to you again soon. Anytime. We'd love to have you back. Up next, why standing with Ukraine really matters. Now for one last thing. There's a fatigue growing in the Western world when it comes to the fight in Ukraine. But on Friday, Canada got an inspiring reminder of what the war is really about. Freedom will be the winner. Justice will be the winner. Zelensky's address was reminiscent of another historic speech to Canada's parliament. Hitler and his Nazi gang have sown the wind. Let them reap the whirlwind. Like the Second World War, the war in Ukraine has a moral aspect. It is not simply a fight for territory, but for democracy and human rights. A defeat for Ukraine could be an existential threat to NATO and to Canada. And while our lives have gone on here at home, the atrocities carried out by the Russian military have continued, and the terror that Ukrainians live with daily must not be forgotten. Just because the war is becoming drawn out and difficult doesn't change what our values or our fortitude should be, which is being tested in this shifting world. And while our support for Ukraine certainly comes at a cost, the bigger cost would be to do nothing. That's our show for today. Thanks for spending time with us, and we'll see you next week.